fan ticket thing that you won and you get to come shag VP. Like this is like the real deal. Like there are security guards telling people to step away because of us. back with another great morning edition uh today we have tyler zuber uh he is a right-handed pitcher for the kansas city royals dudes filthy uh joined us he is a arkansas native and a hell of a human being and uh you're gonna want to stick around for that because that's big before we get into that busy b how you doing we are doing good man we, we brought the daddy hack shirt out of the closet it's back that's right. we're rocking it and then uh no good things happen man we've been having a really successful fall slash winter now and getting ready for some big launches here coming up in january around the holiday season so uh 25 days of giving has been going great we're i think about halfway through now almost it's crazy how fast it goes it's the so 10th. Get, okay so we got another 15 <laughs> <laughs> so we're close a couple weeks in but 10 days in loving it it's been really good very successful a lot of good engagement keep showing up on the platforms you might just win something pretty cool around the christmas time so um yeah man doing good how are you ray i'm great i'm great we've been uh chipping away we've had some really really active members of the community uh, we were just talking about it before the podcast but some of the favorite stuffs uh indy lonely doker like some real ogs in the discord channel so if you're not in the discord channel for projects and not get in there there's a lot of helpful people uh, that are really willing to take people through what's going on, um, you know, with the NFT space. And the number two Saturdays, we've been doing Sandlot Saturdays, which is really more of a hangout session with the boys um, where we're jumping into Twitter spaces. So Saturday mornings, uh, this weekend, we're going 930. This will air after uh, we've launched it. But uh, next Saturday, we'll also do it somewhere around that time. Uh, and we're hoping to do one midweek too. So check out, check that out on Twitter on at Project Sandlot, and we'll have some uh, cool stuff coming up for anybody that wants to hang out so before we get into that uh oh, sorry before we get into this week's zen and, and things like that um tyler zuber how, how would you what do you think about tyler oh dude what a great one of my favorite episodes now just a great yeah dude. me too <laughs> i mean just very humble dude and just such a great guy and uh, i think the best part about it is his story leading into getting to that level and just all the the things that he's battled right the being humbled and going through a lot of adversity and we'll get into that here soon but great dude awesome stuff i love the country accent too man i don't know about the south but the south just gets me so the accent's great man and just a great episode dude great personality no doubt stay with us uh before that though we're gonna get into good news of the week Good news of the week. <laughs> I'll tone that down. Good news of the week. Uh, this week, we have a really cool story. Uh, I actually didn't see where it was from. I'm assuming, actually, I, I don't want to assume. I don't have any idea. Uh, but Emily, <laughs> Ebony Johnson, she works at Dunk, Dunkin' Donuts. Are you a fan, first of all? Dunkin yeah, Donuts? big fan of their coffee. I actually got their coffee, uh, their coffee grinds. Great. Wow, there you go. So Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Ebony works there. Uh, and she's been a great customer service individual for Duncan, I guess. She works the window. Uh, and one of the customers that's been coming through uh, has just built up a really good relationship with her and found out uh, just a week ago or two weeks ago, she was evicted from her house. This is a single mother of three. Totally sad situation. Working at Duncan grinding, right? Well, this woman, Suzanne, uh, went out, uh, talked to a couple different organizations because she needed some help. Uh, but they got her a house and furnished it for her and her three kids uh, in time for the holidays because of the way she's treated uh, Suzanne, this customer. So wow. like went out of her way to find a house for this woman. Like, what do you think about that? Like insane. Like it, it goes back to treat people right. You know what I'm saying? Like yep. it's, it's a staple. That's awesome. What a great story. And going to your local coffee shop, you're getting some coffee. You just kind of go through the motions, I'm sure, and go through the window, boom. But for them, they've built a relationship. And to see somebody give back, especially around this time, is so cool. How rewarding, though. I mean, you get evicted. Like you, oh, I can't even imagine what that feels like. And then now somebody else, out of the goodwill of their heart, says, hey, here's a, a home. It's furnished for your kids. You get to go there. I mean, just that selflessness, dude, that shows that there's a lot of good people in the world doing the right thing. There are, there are, make sure, and it's, it's easy to have that glass half empty look at life sometimes, but the holidays always seem to bring out the other side, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. So yes. 
Number two, Tanner Houck, right-handed pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, uh, elite level right-handed pitcher for the Boston Red Sox, is launching his own NFT. It's already been launched on Etched.co. Uh, but I wanted to bring this up because it's 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 right up your alley, actually. Um, and the story is really cool. His sister, Rihanna, uh, was adopted and has been a part of their family for a long time, obviously. Uh, well, they she actually drew this. It's called uh, Holding Each Other Up. Um, and it's through Etchco again, where the proceeds benefit uh, Caritas Family Solutions and Homes for Little Little Wanderers, uh, basically people that have been or kids that have been adopted and adopted adoption centers. Excuse me, geez. But um, extremely cool cause, uh, and I wanted to get into it a little bit because NFTs obviously have this like kind of stigma around it of being a picture that's worth too much money, whereas like hey us. Tanner, for example, are putting together these things that are really helping communities and, and huge causes. And I think this is the way, uh, you know, charities are kind of going to be run moving forward, honestly. But uh, what do you think about the story? Again, uh, maybe give a little bit of background on your family, too. Yeah, it's a great story, man. And it just shows the utility of what these things can be used for other than just a crazy ape looking like uh, for $500,000. <laughs> so I know some people see that, but um, to see the utility behind it and how people are using these is really, really encouraging. And for him and his story with the adoption, it hits home for us because I'm the oldest of six and we have three adopted kids, right? So three adopted siblings and we took them in and just all the things that they dealt with before they even got to our family. I mean, on the verge of death and just the mental illness and the things that these kids go through that aren't even their choice, right? They're just kind of birthed into it. I mean, it, mm -hmm. they didn't pick to be that way. So having that and being able to give back to those communities is awesome. It's something that's close to our heart and uh, we'd love to support in any way. And however we can help with that and, and spread the word is going to be awesome. And just to see what somebody's doing with their platform, using it for good and using it for something that can impact more people that I think for some reason, adoption and, and foster kids, they kind of go under the radar. I mean, people just, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, it's just such a powerful thing that we can do. So big time project. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm very passionate about it as well. Yeah, I think, uh, and I might have just read a tweet that he's given away a game used glove to do for this. So, uh, you know, if you're, a, if you're a sports fan and you wanted to get into it, there's a good reason. If, if you're just a good human being, go out and buy one. Uh, it's for a great cause. I don't know how many they have left. Probably not too many. Uh, but it's great art by his little sister and, and the whole cause is awesome. So go check them out. Uh, Etched.co. That's going to do it for that. We're going to get into this week's Zen. All right. Welcome back. Did you just hurt yourself? <laughs> yeah, I just stabbed myself with the pencil. <laughs> oh, man. If, by the way, if you guys haven't noticed, and maybe we'll just, I, I, it's going to take some time to go through, but Byler hits his mic like once a show, which is incredible. So make sure you keep an eye out for it. If you tag us in any comment and just the time at which he hits that, I'll give you a prize. <laughs> um, anyways, this week's Zen, uh, we wanted to get into self-talk a little bit and, and BZB, we're big on the self-talk. Um, what you see is what you or what, uh, sorry, it's not what you look at that matters. It's what you see, as Theodore Roosevelt said. Uh, and a lot of that comes into the self-talk. For you, break it down for us a little bit of uh, what makes a really good, strong self-talk uh, where the affirmations work. And where does that self-talk go sideways for somebody that's struggling? That's a great question, Ray. It's been something that's popped up a lot in our recent just working with these different programs that we get to work with. And it's been probably the hottest topic in the last two weeks of all, right? Between all of the levels, high school and college. And I'm um, seeing it with athletes specifically, but then relating it to anybody who's living, right? Because we all have that self-talk piece. Um, when you go and ask somebody, hey, how often do you talk to yourself? Like, I don't ever talk to myself. What do you mean? He's like, no, we talk to ourselves mentally all day long. And so the goal of self-talk is just being able to be your best encourager. And I like saying your best coach instead of your worst critic, because if I think of one of my favorite coaches, they're coaching you up. How would they respond in the heat of battle or when mm -hmm. something goes sideways in your family or personal life or school doesn't work out? What would that coach say to you or that mentor say to you versus the critic? So I use Rotten Tomatoes as an example, because their goal and not calling them out, but their goal is to make the movie like degrade the movie, right? 6.7 on a 10 out of 10 movie. I'm like, dude, that movie was fire. There's no way it's a six and a half, 
but they're kind of just critiquing all the little things in that movie instead of let's be our own best coach and just coach yourself up a little bit. So with the the athletes and then with just anybody in general, I think a lot of it comes from little instances. Um, I don't know who said it. Maybe I just heard it on a podcast, but it's crazy that one little moment can turn into a lifetime of misery in a way, like one little thing goes wrong in a day and it ruins your whole day. One little thing was said that just kind of rubbed you the wrong way or you heard on the radio and it bleeds into everything else that you have in your life. Instead of just being able to be able to capture that when it happens and fix our self-talk in those moments. So an example of this, you're driving down the road, you got the radio on and you hear a commercial, right? And commercials, I don't really care for commercials, but you hear a commercial or an ad and the ad isn't in your favor, right? It could be political. It could be um, life-wise. It could be a cause. It could be somebody talking and you don't like it, right? And when you hear it, you're like, eh, screw that person, right? Or instantly you get really upset. And then the rest of the day, you're walking around with rage and bitterness because you're upset of somebody else. An Instagram post, you see something that somebody posts that you don't agree with and you get upset about it. You don't say anything. Maybe you do. You might shoot off a message or something. But for the most part, you're only talking to yourself about it and saying, I can't believe this person believes that. How could they be in that type of column? Blah, 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 blah. And it starts to get the best of us and ruins our day. So talking to ourselves first, listening to ourselves, very important. If we can learn to talk to ourselves more, coach ourselves up, be our own best friend instead of be our own worst enemy, we're going to get through a lot of these situations a heck of a lot easier. So that's something we encourage our athletes to do. I encourage anybody else out there that's listening to this podcast or gets to hear this on Twitter later. Uh, about just, hey, let's talk to ourselves more. Right? Let's be our own best coach, coach yourself up and be that leader that we want to be just to help us and others right around us. Let me bring this back to a, a very common story. And, and this is one that has happened to me many times, but I'm just going to tell it about this one time. Uh, <clears throat> my best golf round of all time was in 81. Played at my home course. I, I worked and I was mowing these greens for six months. I, I know the course, right? So out of my mind, playing all day i get to about hole 15 i'm like this is the best round i've ever had there's no doubt like i'm about to score an 80 for the first time in my life right or sub 80 get chip away 15 16 17 all pretty solid and at the start of the 18th hole i'm like damn hope you don't choke this one right <laughs> like hope you don't throw this one away and and of course i get up there i have a six foot putt to sink for an 80 we <laughs> You know, it just feels off. And that's just the way it goes. Cause the entire time I'm just thinking like, please don't miss, you know, don't screw this one up for your, your best score of all time. And you know, it is what it is, but uh, I'm with you. The positive self-talk can make or break your day. And uh, the negative can really spiral. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt. So. Quickly, quickly. Anyways, uh, Tyler Zuber, we'd already touched on it briefly. This dude is a legend uh, and make sure you stay till the end because at the end he doesn't really, it's hilarious the way he breaks down his on it or off it. So uh, stay through that and we're going to get right into it. Welcome in back to the Champion School Podcast, man. We're fired up to be back here. We got the whole squad. I'm Austin Byler. We got Ray Mack, JP, and a very special guest, Tyler Zuber here. Pitcher in the uh, Kansas City Royals organization made up to the big leagues. This dude's got a lot of good stuff, man. We're fired up for it. Um, but before we get into it, Tyler, how are you doing, man? Welcome to the show. Man, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, just enjoying, enjoying the offseason. Let's go, man. Well, before we dive into your story, man, what's like – Fill us in on the off season, man. What's the off season look like for a professional athlete? Uh, well, I don't have like the, I probably don't have the the strict schedule that uh, everyone imagines and probably want. Like, well, a lot of people probably want my schedule, but I don't have the strictest schedule like everyone else. I wake up anywhere from eight thirty to nine thirty every day. Um. Today was my day to sleep in a little bit. Uh, so I got to sleep in until about 10. And then um, I go I go up to Arkansas State and I do play some catch. I chit chat with the coaches for a little bit, play some catch. Uh, if it's a bullpen day, bullpen, long toss day, whatever, just play some catch. And then go over to the football weight room and get a lift in. 
And then that normally puts me around the like the 12, 30, one o'clock range. And after that, nothing. <laughs> Sounds like a, a nice schedule. I like mm-hmm. that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you play video games or anything? Are you, you, you a gamer or any of that? <sighs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm a, I'm a big, I'm a big gamer. So that's, nice. that, that pretty much takes me from about, I don't know, one to five and then <laughs> six to 12. Probably You're a grinder. I love it. <laughs> well, for I food. Mean, my, I, my, my parents always get worried that, you know, something that I'm getting bored or something in here, but like, I, I this is what I enjoy. That's what I, I enjoy. I, I go and do my work and then I and do what I like to do afterwards. But then there's also a, uh, then they always get worried. Like if I'm going to go out and about and like all that stuff, but as soon as my door shuts and around one one o'clock, one thirty in the afternoon, it never reopens. Like it, <laughs> That's awesome. I'm in my apartment and I'm I'm here. So like it, I'm about as safe as I could possibly be. <laughs> that is so cool, man. I, I think a lot of like athletes, their second, uh, actually even sometimes their first passion is video games, <laughs> and it's like a good outlet to check out. And then we're competitors, yeah. man. We want to compete. It's like let's compete in the video game sticks too. Like nobody's beating us. Mm-hmm. We're, we're getting after. What's the what's the go to game? What's your game of choice? Um. I play, I play MLB the show, and yes, I do play as myself sometimes. <laughs> uh, I love it, love it. Um, I'm still on the Fortnite grind, uh, and then I play some a little bit of Call of Duty, just playing just like regular, not Warzone, just like the regular one. Nice, love that. Me and me and Ray Mac were big time Call of Duty fans. I think yeah, one I of our main, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, one of our main missions in life were to be. Uh, MLG players, we want to make it make it to the big leagues of the, the video games, but we found out quickly that the strats and the skill level just doesn't really compare to those no. dudes on YouTube. <laughs> so we, cracked. Dude, unreal, They're unreal, unbelievable, <laughs> just dotting us from across the map, dude. And half your age too. <laughs> yeah, I know. yeah, I know. Teen, they're yeah. they're still they're still in their teens, uh, and they're able to do they they go to school. And then as soon as they get home from school from 3.30 until 10 o'clock at night, that's all they do. Yep. Yeah. We had a, one of my, my old high school coach, his son is, uh, he's like 19 now, but he's like a big time professional Fortnite gamer. And like, they didn't know what to expect because they've been travel ball, club ball, all this like baseball stuff. Right. And he stopped playing baseball to pursue Fortnite and he was going to Vegas driving over. I'm in Arizona. So right down the road and uh, he's making money in Vegas on these Fortnite games, playing on the national stage. I'm like, dude, why? Like, he's like nationally known on Instagram and stuff. I'm like, dude, this is a crazy world. Uh, but hey, Who is it? teach their own um, apex. He's with Apex, and I think his last, I think his thing is Swarm, I believe is his name, his tag, Swarm. I got to double check. He's super good at Fortnite. I mean, just um, like, dude, he's moving too fast for me to even see the screen. <laughs> I'll get the name. I'll send it to you for sure so you can check uh, it out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's good, though. Uh, but let's dive into your story, man. I'll kick it off to these guys. But what, what's kind of your story, man? How'd you get into professional baseball? How'd you get into baseball in the first place? Played at Arkansas State. You've been a, a really good athlete, I'm sure, for a long time. But what kind of just got you into this, this sport of baseball and kind of pursuing a high-level passion that you have? Um, I think my parents told me when I was like four or something like that, I, I picked up a ball for the first time and I would like throw it around the living room. And so then they said, they never said anything about baseball or I, they never mentioned like, do I want to play? I played soccer for like when I was three and four. And then after I finished that four year old soccer year, they said, I wanted to be done. And then I started playing T-ball at five or no, like the spring, the spring slash summer of four. And then I've just played and I, you know, I loved it. And then I was eight and I saw some kids throwing a bullpen. I thought I want to do that. I want to be a pitcher too. And so then I pitched, pitched pretty well. And then I started doing pitching lessons and then pitching lessons led into well, let's do a little bit of travel ball. Um, mm. Like we got what our, my travel ball when I grew up was you grab a bunch of local players and you go to like these tournaments, like 30 minutes away, hour away, like not like 
we're going to form like a nationally known team and we're going to spend $6,000 and we're going to go drive across country to New York, to Washington, to California, down to Florida. And then we're going to finally come home. Yeah. Um, this is like, we're just going to drive 30 minutes and we're going to play six games on a weekend and then we're going to go home and then that's going to be it. So that, that it basically turned into that. And then it turned into, well, I'm out, obviously I'm throwing harder and I'm better than the guys that I'm around in high school. Maybe I want, like, I want to pursue more. Like I want to play college ball. And I remember I told my grandma that I was going to make it to the big leagues one day before she passed. I told her back in when I was like, I don't know, like 14 or 15 or so, something like that. So then I got to ninth and 10th grade. And that's whenever I started making like a, it's like a growth spurt slash puberty. So like my body was like developing and I didn't understand why in the world my mechanics were so off and why I like I went from being good to like, all of a sudden I sucked. And it's like, why? And it's like, I was trying to figure out my mechanics again. And then, then it made, then it started making me question if I really want to do this again. And then all of a sudden my junior year come and I finally got into the gym for probably, shoot, I was probably in the gym for five months straight, like five times a week, I could just getting after it. And all of a sudden I get off a mound and, I'm locating fastballs where I want. I got a good breaking ball again. I'm like, this is not the, I'm not the same pitcher that I was just a year ago. And so then we end up winning state that year. I get a few colleges start talking to me. I go to a underclass all-star game and I hit 90 for the first time. And all of a sudden a bunch of more colleges reached out and then uh, committed to ASU, to ASU for four years of a year, my junior year. When I say blessing, not many people re- realize, like, like what, what are you talking about, a blessing? Get a separate, like, how is that a blessing? But it was like, I was not ready for professional baseball based on, like, all the hype and the, the buildup and the, dude, you're going to get drafted so high, you're going to make so much money, body, body, blah, blah. Um, it got to my head. My ego got too big. And so then my junior year, obviously I got humbled. And then my senior year, I basically came back with the attitude of like, I need to, like, I have something to prove. Um, and I have to do something to separate myself, made some changes, got some spikes and some velos, made some jumps, and then ended up getting drafted and being the highest pick at ASU ever. And then, you know, climbed the ranks of, of the minor leagues and then got told last year during COVID like, Hey, you made the squad. And that was, it took, it took probably three or four days for that, that to settle in. And then it finally settled in. As soon as I stepped foot in Cleveland, I was like, Oh my gosh, like I'm on a big league field. And it's not like some fan fan ticket thing that you won and you get to come shag BP like this is like the real deal like there are security guards telling people to step away because of us and I oh my gosh like I couldn't I I couldn't describe it I really couldn't it was just I was in awe can you talk to us I listened to an interview and your parents seem so humble too like awesome people but your dad and mom were talking about they were out digging diamonds, I think, the day that they heard. Like, what, what happened? What was up with that? So that story was, so obviously, we had spring training 1.0, COVID, spring training 2.0. So spring training 2.0, everybody, if you, it was like service time kind of deal, but it was like a lot, like, the old, basically the older guys were in the big league clubhouse, and the younger guys, non-roster guys, were in the, uh, visiting clubhouse we play Houston in Kansas City for two games then we go to St. Louis so we're in Houston so we're playing Houston we'll just for the sake of the story we'll say we're playing Houston on Thursday but well, we had to get all of our stuff out of the visiting clubhouse on Tuesday because Houston was coming in on Wednesday to load up all their stuff in the locker room so it's on Tuesday and 
I'm asking all the guys in the clubhouse, you know, hey, like, what's the deal? Like, are you going to the T-Bones Stadium or are you staying here? And they said, no, I'm going to T-Bones. I said, how do you know? I said, well, Mike told us. I said, okay. I said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the T-Bones. Mike told us. Where are you going? I'm staying here for to practice. Mike told us. Well, ain't nobody told me nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm asking the clubbies, you know, I'm like, hey, like, where do like where does my bag need to go? And he goes, um, has anyone told you anything? No. Huh. I guess you just come with me. I said, well, where's that going? And he said, going to the T-ball stadium. I said, okay. So Wednesday was the was a team practice. Um, we like the younger guys that were in the visiting clubhouse went to the T-ball stadium to practice. The older guys stayed at Kaufman and practiced. So doing practice, doing all that stuff, I get back. That night I get a phone call from the pitching coach from Cal. He said, hey, don't worry about going to the T-Bones the next on uh, Thursday. You're going to pitch against Houston on Thursday. So I said, okay, no problem. Like, so I drove over that morning, got my stuff, just, I mean, glove, sliders, I mean, just the bare minimum stuff. I grabbed it all, drove back over to – to Kaufman, I was under the impression that all the taxi or all the guys that were throwing that night were going to be there. So I get there, I'm, you know, hanging out, trying not to step on any toes. You know, I'm basically just trying to keep quiet and they call a team meeting. So I go like, okay, then team meeting. So I go and sit down there and I'm looking around and I am the only person that was at the T-bones that is, that is there. <laughs> And so instant panic in my head. I'm thinking I'm not in the right place. Wrong place. I, <laughs> I, I need to run. I need, I, I don't know what to do. So I go, I'm like walking up the steps and I feel like this, somebody like doing this on my back. And I'm like, like oh gosh, like, there's my the thing right behind me. And he said, you ever been to the principal's office? And I thought, golly, man, I done messed up. And I said, no. I said, like, well, maybe once. And he goes, well, I'm the principal today, and you need to come to my office. I thought, God. Okay, I'm coming. So I go into his office. And he said, shut the door. I said, oh. I said, just do it. Just do it quickly, please. Just stab me in the heart quick. Just get it over. With. <laughs> he said, he said, hey, uh, he said, are you going? He said, have you, uh, have you already talked to your parents today? I said, no. He said, well, uh, I just want to let you know, like, that, you know, you've done everything that you need to do to make this team. Um, but, you know, there's there's moves that need to be made. And, you know, you not being on the roster, it kind of hurts you. Um, and it, it, there, may, there needs to be a lot more moves in order to put you on the roster. And it's not just a simple call you up. It's a find an opening, put you on, blah, 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 like all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I mean, yeah, like, I understand how it works. Like, I'm with you. And I said, you know, I, I tried to do everything I can to make the team. He said, well, you know, I don't – you know, we appreciate everything that you've done. Um, but, you know, you're you're going to be on the flight to Cleveland. And then he then he changed the subject quick, and he moved on to something else. I said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Huh? I'm going to be on the flight to Cleveland. I said, does that mean I'm on the team or what? And he's like, well – yes, but there has to be some moves yet to keep quiet. I said, does that mean I'm on the team? Like, do I need to call my parents and tell them like, Hey, I made the team or like, he said, you can call them and tell them you're going to be in Cleveland. There's no guarantee you're on the team. I said, no, am I on the team? And he said, <laughs> we'll talk about it later. And so I called, so I called my parents after that, um, I'm out in my vehicle and I said, Hey, he said, what are y'all doing? He said, Well, we're just out in the middle of the field digging for diamonds in the middle of dirt. I said, Okay. I said, Well, I'm uh I'm gonna I'm gonna be in Cleveland here in a couple of days. And they both were like, huh? I said, What well, what does that mean? I said, Well, opening days in Cleveland. And my mom was like, Tyler Zuber, what does that mean? And I said, Well, I think that means I made the team. And they were like, Mom, then mom goes into a panic and she's like, 
John, Sydney, we, 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 we got we to gotta go. We got we to gotta go. We, 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 we got to find a way to Little Rock. We, I'm, I'm going to start looking up plane tickets. And I said, Mom, it's COVID. There's no fans. Y'all can't come to the game. I said, what are y'all going to do? Fly to Cleveland so you can sit in a hotel room? Like, I don't even I don't even know at this point if I can even see y'all. Like, it's like at that point, like, and she was like, well, what, what, am I, what am I supposed to do? And I said, watch on TV like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> I said, but I said, I just had to tell y'all this. And they're like, well, we, we, and my dad at that point grabbed the phone. I was like, so what, what, what's this news? What's this news? Because he didn't hear it. I was only talking. I thought <laughs> mom had me on speakerphone. So, yeah, that's the story. Of course, that's incredible. And, and JP, I'll kick it off to you, but that's it almost brought me to tears. Like, makes me happy just seeing your joy and then watching your parents' reaction. Like, so cool because your dad and, and I got to figure out what TV plan your dad bought because he said he was able to get all the games for MLB and watch them all. But he said that was the one thing he had to do right away to make sure that uh, he could I see think, all your I stuff. Mean, I want to say. I think this is before like maybe all like the blackout stuff, but yeah. he just had like the regular MLB package. Very nice. Love it. JP. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what was it like to make that debut during COVID? I know it's probably completely different than now in 2021 where they had fans and things like that, but can you kind of take us into what it was like making that debut? How did you stay day to day in the grind and developing routines and things like that during that year? Well, I didn't really get to, uh, get into a routine before I made my debut. It was, it was a two nothing. It was, I mean, it was a heck of a ball game going into it. Um, and I remember sitting in the bullpen, had my hoodie on legs crossed, just head back chilling like this. And the phone rings. I like, look down Barlow. Okay. Lean back phone rings. Holland. Okay. So now it's like, it's late in the game. I mean, it's eighth inning. I'm a. I'm never pitched a day in the big leagues. It's two to nothing ball game. It's still one swing in the bat, and we take the lead basically. And you know, there's guys down there like Kennedy still has a thrown. Uh, Rosenthal still has a thrown. Stalmont, like, there's all these like guys that have had substantial innings down there, and I'm like, okay, what? It like likelihood they're probably in this game. Phone rings at the uh, top of the eight. And um, he said, Zuber, you're in the game. I thought, <laughs> okay. Take my money off, <laughs> get loose. It's so like, I'm just doing my normal warm up and whatnot in the bullpen. And, um, you know, then, it, then it's like, boom, all right, all right, Zuber, you're in the game. That's out number three. Okay, so I walk down the steps at Cleveland, and right as soon as I take a step on the warning track, they start to play God Bless America. So I get all the way into the mound, and I was like, standing on the mound, and I was like, watching, looking at the flag, and I have my heart like this, a hand like this over my heart. And all of a sudden, I was like, okay, well, I know where's my heart not like slowing down? And it's just like this, and it's like, it's not slowing down, like, I'm not moving. <laughs> and it's like beating out of my chest i'm thinking i can't slow this down i legitimately cannot slow this down like i don't know what to do i remember my first warm-up pitch um i think i threw it 150 miles an hour like i think it was that hard it was <laughs> like it's it was like out of my hand and in sal's mitt before i could even blink i thought huh Ain't nobody touching me right now. Ain't <laughs> nobody like, dang. Ain't I, mean, I feel bad for these hitters. And normally, like I would, I would expect if I was a veteran hitter, like the Hernandez guy faced Caesar Hernandez, I would think rookie on the mound. I know he's trying to get ahead, but he's also pitching in the big league, so this is probably gonna be ball one. So I'm gonna take right here. No, first pitch, he swings and rolls over a ground ball. Now I got to go cover first. <laughs> uh, it was – but that was kind of like the, the first pitch, kind of like that build up. But it was like getting a pitch in, in the big leagues in 2020 was – there was no help getting like the adrenaline because it was pitching in the big leagues. Um, staying ready all year, it was mostly talking to those veteran guys 
Like, if it wasn't for those guys, like, there's no getting ready and staying ready and whatnot because those guys have done it for 10 years, 14 years, eight years. Like, they've done it for that long. So, like, the amount of knowledge and the amount of experience that they have. So that's that's basically how I stayed ready. Um, that's, like, a little bit of how pitching in the big leagues was in 2020. Very, very odd looking around with, like, a – kind of looking like the squid games a little bit <laughs> like some cut out with some cutouts and whatnot but uh it was you know it was still pitched in the big leagues and you're still facing the same guys that you've watched on tv is just with no fans i love that it's it's so fun to hear the stories too, the background because i mean we watch it from tv now and you're, you're seeing it and you you see nobody in the stands now obviously you see people in the stands and you hear a lot of good stories but just to know like how fast the hearts beat and how excited you are how, how eager you are and it's like man nothing's controlling this i just gotta go like i'm just gonna go out there and let it eat um it's ooh. It's awesome. I, I love hearing it because it shows the passion and it's a childhood dream coming true, man. And um, maybe like something's kind of segueing into this is now you've had a couple of years under your belt. You've been up there. I'm sure you've had a lot of good mentors in that bullpen with some of those guys you named who have been around for a while, pitching some really big games, World Series and all those. Um, who's been somebody that's kind of taken you under your wing? in that bullpen or maybe just on the team, maybe one of the veterans that's just kind of like put his arm around you. Maybe it's a collective group of them, but have just kind of helped you get your feet wet there and help you mentally prepare and, and stay ready for those opportunities to have a little bit of experience. Um, I'd probably say, you know, like you've probably seen a million times, but Duffy was probably like one of the best ones. Um, as far as like, you could talk to him about life. You could talk to him about, experiences um off the field on the field um and then i would say baseball kind of related i would say greg holland mm. um he was one i tried to lean on because similar build like height wise like we're both not the tallest people um i was told similar stuff um, so basically I was like, you know, well, how in the world, like, what did you do? Basically trying to pick his brain on that aspect. But those were two that I would say that, and then Ian Kennedy, because he was, he went from being a starter to now all of a sudden he was, I mean, arguably in what was it? 2019. He was arguably like one of the best closers in the game after never closing a ball game a day in his life. And now all of a sudden he's thrown into one of the highest, like, the highest leverage spot in the big leagues and being the closer and he dominates and he has 30 something saves. So like mm -hmm. talking to him about like that transition and like how did it affect his like preparation, his mentality and whatnot going from, all right, you got the ball pitch number one and ideally you don't want to give it up until the last pitch of the ball game. And then that's, you know, that's kind of like a, a win and a CG under your belt. So, like, how did he go about that? You know, Greg, how did he go about what he did for so long? Um, and then Duffy just kind of how did, like, life on life on the outside, like, just kind of like if I don't want to talk about baseball, I could go to Duffy and talk about whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this year this year was nice getting to talk to Greg and Wade because, obviously, Wade brings a different – he brings a different food to the table than Greg does. Both were really, I mean, several years ago, elite, like, and held it for five years and, at a time. Like, we're just the best in the game. I mean, are you? I mean, there's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like, those two and Herrera were the best in the game. Mm. But what made them so great? Obviously, they have the stuff, but what made you so great at that time? Like, in, like, the most unhumbling, humbling way, how did you – how were you so successful for five, six, seven years in a row of just pure dominance? Like there was no, uh, they were decent for five or six games and they sucked. No, it was dominance for five or six years. So it's the, that basically those guys were who I kind of leaned on a lot um, and trying to like basically learn the league and learn, learn about myself through them a little bit more. 
that's so good. Ray, you got something? Yeah, in college baseball, especially, there's, I mean, uh, and baseball in general, there's just like a surplus of right handed pitchers and, and height generally isn't going to get you further. I'm five, eight myself. I wasn't getting any extra looks for, for being me, you know? So for you uh, reaching out to some of these other guys in college and younger dudes that are, are trying to pursue your path, what's something that you would tell them to help them along? Um, my best advice uh, that I would give would be, There's so many things. Um, be to do something that sets yourself apart from the guy next to you. Mm. So that's what I understood as a senior was I was 88 or 89 to 91, touch 92. Well, how many 89 to 92 guys are there in college baseball? Yes, there's a high chance that I probably get drafted because I've got some numbers and I'm older and it's just there's a chance and being a senior son it's not like a high risk kind of deal but what can I do to separate myself from those styles and other right-handed pitchers and so I got did some stuff and all of a sudden my first bullpen I was 94 95 and so now that now put me in a different category in college that now it's like all right now he's doing harder and then I put the innings with the no hits with the punch outs together. And that basically set me up, set me apart. I would say do something to set yourself apart. Um, be, I forget the saying, but it's like something like be okay with being uncommon or something like that. Mm. Um, even if it, you have to do something that looks so funky, but it sets you apart and it does well for you do it. Um, don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something because I am the prime example of you'll never make it to the college level. And I did, you'll never get drafted. And I did, you'll never make it to the big leagues with all the odds stacked against me. And I did, um, no matter what anyone says to you, the only opinion that matters is your own. That's, that's the only opinion that matters. Um, everything that's inside of you you have to let everything kind of fuel that fire inside of you basically and help that pursue what you want in life. And I mean, that's, that's, I didn't, I didn't think about it like that when I was coming up, but it's what I did. If that makes sense. Like I wasn't all this stuff I said, I didn't think like, all right, well, I'm going to let all that be the my driving factor. It was like, okay, well, I'm just going to prove you wrong. Like, like who are you to tell me that I can't play college baseball? Like what? hundred uh, percent. There's a million nuggets. We're going to clip like four or five of those different sentences right there and not throw them as individual clips, but go ahead, JP. Yeah. I think you touched on something important. That's kind of uh, your mindset and things. And I know uh, you touched, uh, talked about this a little bit on another podcast where when you got sent down to Omaha, that kind of uh, changed your mindset a little bit. Can you take us into that moment of uh, kind of how you dealt with kind of the ups and downs that come with the game. Yeah, it was a, uh... I just I gotten into a rut when I was in Kansas City and I basically in my head I was like I could see the light at the end of the tunnel just getting smaller and smaller and I just felt like I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to like almost like that little confusion of I don't know how to get outs right now. Like I need I need something. I need a change of scenery. I need somebody to just tell me, hey stand on your head and throw a ball and you'll get all the outs in the world. Like I needed something. And so they told me I was going down because I wasn't helping out the team there. Um, I wasn't throwing in a good role. I was, you know, throwing up by 10, down by 10. And it wasn't like I was throwing well, even when I was doing that. So it was like, I need something. So I sent me down and it was just kind of like a <sighs> kind of moment. Like, mm -hmm. I felt like all the world was off my shoulders. There was no pressure. It was like, finally, we get back to pitching and get back to baseball. And then it was like, you know what? I kind of got that little swagger back. There's like, a, there's a little bit more intensity on the mound. It was just kind of like, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready to come back up. And I went back up. I threw well. And then I got told I was going back down. I thought, oh, no. 
So then it was like, you know what? This is part of the game. Now I just have to, wherever I'm at, I have to try to do my job as best as possible. And that's ultimately, that's exactly what I tried to do was, you know what? I'm just going to do this as best as I possibly can. And, you know, I can't control what happens. You know, I get sent down, I get called back up, whatever happens. If I end up in Omaha at the end of the year, great. If I am in Kansas City, great. But I'm going to do, I'm going to do my best to make the best of it. Um, and that's, it's basically what I tried to do. It, it's awesome to hear something that's kind of been a theme of this. Dude. Other than the great personality and the humbleness is using some tragedies, you could say, in some people's eyes are like a, a big time failure and allowing it to catapult you to that next level. And you've used a couple of them throughout your life. And one being obviously the the height piece, the, the velo piece. Then you're going into college. You get humbled as a, as a junior. You're trying to go in as a senior sign. I was a senior sign as well. And there's just a lot of things that go into it that – you kind of have your back against the wall and for you to use some of those experiences to fuel you, right? I think a lot of people in life, especially today, we just allow those to defeat us and we stop moving forward, but you say, Hey, never let somebody tell you that you can't do something. And if it's, if you're the only one that believes it, cool, that's good. Cause as long as you believe it, you will achieve it. So I think that's really cool. I, I'll kind of want to walk through and then Ray, I'll kick it to you for the game, uh, the little game piece, but for you, Zub, what does mental preparation look like, especially as a reliever in professional baseball? And you can go through the minor leagues to professional, maybe like how it's changed for you too over time. But um, what does the mental preparation look like? We're huge on it. We're big into it. Um, I was kind of the dude who did the visualization in the outfield who looked different, but it helped me so much. It just got my mind right, right? It got me dialed in. That was my deal. Um, but I, I really relate to that when you said that. So for you, what's something that you maybe do mentally to help you prepare or even things that you're seeing with some of the other guys on the team that just help them get into that peak performance state more often? Um, basically just kind of watching the game, getting a feel for the game. That can kind of help get you into it. Um, for me, and, and what I found is breathing, like taking mm -hmm. deep breaths, and something that I used to do um, that kind of like kind of gets you back into it is you try to find something there to look at and kind of like reset your focus a little bit. So I used to like anytime I felt like the game was speeding up, I would step off the mound, take a deep breath and look at the left field foul pole because every stadium is going to have a foul pole. So like if you try to think, well, I'm going to look at section 107 seat J like that's that that's that's where I'm gonna look well not every stadium is gonna have that seat in that exact same spot but every stadium is gonna have a foul pole every stadium is gonna have a third base right there every stadium is gonna have a rubber every stadium is gonna have something like that so you can find something out there that's like that's where I'm gonna look and you know that's that's what I'm gonna do that's like my cue to reset kind of get your body back into it and kind of like realize okay this is my job this is what i need to do and then go do it um that's i mean as far as mental preparation goes i don't really it's not like i do a whole bunch it's not like i do a whole bunch of visualization i mean i visualize like pretty much every single night like doing like well like getting three punch outs in an inning like like everyone else like facing three different hitters getting three punch outs, but as far as like getting doing the sequences and all that stuff, not really. Um, I look, I mean, you look at like some scouting reports or whatever on the guys that you think you're going to face. But if you know me and you know the Zuber luck, that ain't, the, that ain't the fact I can have, I can know, <laughs> I can know that I'm going to face you guys you are the three hitters I'm going to face. And I'm like, I know how to get all three of them out, left-handed and right-handed, pitching backwards and pitching forwards. I know exactly how I'm going to do it. The time comes, all three of you get bent, pinch hit for. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, That's awesome. Well, man. good thing I had no idea that that was going to happen, that they were going to pinch hit a righty for another righty. I thought they were going to pinch hit for the lefty. But whatever, it was just – but, like, that's a little bit of what I do. But I've kind of learned when I started that, um, I realized that it would cause me to almost panic a little bit because, like, 
oh gosh, I'm not facing Austin. Uh, I, I, I've prepared for this guy. Like, what, what do I need to do? So I got a little too – I went a little too overdrive on it. And then I basically just said, keep it simple, stupid. If the slider's not working tonight but the changeup is or the curveball is, that's what I'm using. Not trying to force the slider. It's basically we're going to go with what two or three pitches are working tonight, and that's it. And then we're going to set up each pitch the way that we need to, and we're going to get outs that way. And so when I did that, it was like, why in the world did I even stress at all? <laughs> Pitching so much easier when you keep it simple. Yeah, and a lot of people, right, They, the moment gets big. They allow the moment to get the best of them, and you see people just going totally out of control off the rails in those moments, right? I can't even mm-hmm. imagine big leagues. You got 40,000 people screaming at you and yelling at you, especially if you're sitting in the bullpen, some of the stuff they're throwing or saying to you all day, throwing beer down. Like, those people are just all faded in the outfield. So, um, But I like the part about everyone's different. Right. For you, maybe it's not necessarily always the visualization before a game, but it's knowing the hitters that you might face or just being prepared for that and just getting your, your bearing set, finding the focal point, resetting a little bit. It's good. Like it's really, really good. And I think that helps a lot of our audience, especially the coaches, giving back to their players as far as, hey, guys, like this might work for you, but this one might be better for you in this case. Hey, try this, try this. Right. So everybody's a little different. Um, I love that. Ray, I'll kick it back to you. Kind of wrap us up. Yeah, we got a quick little game for you. Um, if you're good with playing, I know I know you're a competitor, so uh, it's called on it or off it. Uh, we're gonna run through ten quick things, just random lists, and you're gonna tell us you're on it, like you're for it, you're off it, not really your thing, and then a quick sentence as to why that's your case. Okay. Sound good? Sounds right, good. Go. Number one, golfing. <laughs> off it, 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 off it. Off it, off it. I'm horrible. I suck. I don't want to do it. I'll do, do putt putt and I'll do top golf. That's it. <laughs> we we gotta take these mental strategies to your golf game here. <laughs> um, coffee, black coffee. On it, on it, on it, on it. I almost, I was this close to starting up a pot about five minutes ago, but I was like, you know what? No, I ain't gonna do it. I'm. I need to I need to lay off the caffeine today, but I love. I used to not like coffee. I used to have like have to put in uh, like a bucket of sugar in it, but now like I can I'd prefer it black with nothing in it. Good for you. Uh, NASCAR. Mm-hmm. I guess off it. I just I can't get excited about watching cars just do like. <laughs> I just yeah, can't get excited about that. But you know, some people like it. Whatever. There you go. Monopoly. On it. I mean, I enjoy those kind of games and being competitive. It's it's just another another thing that you can I guess you can say you can win at. Yep. Uh candy canes. Off it. I ain't never been a fan. I I've never <laughs> been a fan of like like things like that. Yep. Okay. Super Mario. On it. I enjoy it. I enjoy playing it. Gas grills. Oh, on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so much. So, they're just a lot easier than charcoal. I mean, it just hands down. Yep. I agree. Uh, Settlers of Catan. Have you ever seen that game? I'm going to say off it because I have no idea what you just said. That's all good. <laughs> Neither all do good. I. Yeah. Uh, three one change ups. I'm on it. Hit, if you ask the hitter, they're off it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last one uh, opening presents on Christmas Eve. Ooh. Okay, so we used to do that as a family. Yeah, like me, uh, me and my sister, we used to do that, and then Christmas morning was Santa. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'd always open up all the gifts, and it'd give us kind of a night to play with the gifts. But it wasn't like it wasn't the best gifts that we got. Like they were good. Like they were good. It was what we wanted, but it wasn't the best ones. Christmas morning was like the yeah. Oh my god! It was like those gifts. Yeah, and so. I don't, since I'm older now and you know I don't really get a much of a Christmas it's like maybe like a gift or um, two gifts it's not much 
I would say no, just because I don't have anything. Um, you asked me this when I was 10, on it. You asked me this at 26, I'm off it. <laughs> Very good. Right on, man. Well, you, you killed it. You're 26. You said you have a sister. Are you older or younger than your sister? She's younger. She's 22. Nice. Right on, man. Well, hey, I appreciate it. Uh, JP, do you have anything you want to wrap up with Todd before we get him out of here? Yeah, no. Thanks for joining us. It was great to hear your stories and the, the background of everything going from the minors to the, the big league. So we never, don't always get those stories, and it was just awesome to hear. Yeah. Love yeah. It, well, thank you guys for having me. Thank y'all for listening. Dude, great. So I could listen to you talk for hours, man. It That's must right. be the accent. That I love the South, man. I don't know what it is, but <laughs> it fires me up, man. Um, we're, we're blessed, man. We're honored and we're grateful for you. And, and we're sending our best to you, man, throughout this spring season coming back. Um, and I'm in Arizona, man. So if you're out here, we'll take you out and get some food, get some coffee, get some drinks, do something out this way. But uh, super stoked, man. Super excited. And let us know if there's anything we can do to help you guys and, and moving forward. But we're sending you our best, man. Have a good holiday season. Awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. Y'all, y'all have a happy holidays as well. All right. We're back. Uh, first of all, Tyler, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, I know you got some time in the off season. You're probably pretty busy with Fortnite right now. I understand. Uh, but you, you earned it. You deserve it. You guys have worked your butts off all year. Uh, you guys take your downtime, but bye. What'd you think about the interview? I think it was a great story, and I love the fact that it didn't come easy. You know, senior signed to the big leagues. A lot of people think it's got to go either high school, senior, or junior out of college and get all this money and all this other stuff, but you can make it there with different paths, right? So I think everybody's journey is different, and for him, he found some things that worked, and he got humbled a little bit in professional baseball, which happens quickly, and he realized that he's putting too much pressure on himself, trying too hard, and then he made the adjustments, and it helped him be more successful. So I think just listening to the mentors that he gets to be around in that bullpen and be able to just pick each other's brain and, and just keep working, right? Keep working, keep your head down, grind it out, and just be the best that you can be is really, really cool. And then also his Fortnite abilities, pretty impressive, right? That's a pretty yeah. good regimen in the offseason. I like it. What about you? Yeah, for for guys that have that, that it goes back to the self talk of like, and maybe other people have told them that started the the mindset of, hey, you're a short right handed pitcher, you know, and and to work through that your entire career knowing, hey, I'm not the biggest dude, I don't have a left hand, I don't throw a hundred, well, it started to taken up towards that, right? But um, they, he had to fight through that adversity, and and I'm sure there was days where he's going like, this isn't for me, you know, like this isn't my deal. Uh, I'm not gifted with 102 or, or uh, you know, a left arm, but he worked through it and, and he's there where he's at today because of that strong mentality. Uh, and like you said, even maybe, maybe putting the pressure on himself for sure, but to, to work through that says a lot about the human being for sure. So, uh, Tyler, thank you so much for joining us uh, and thank you all for listening. You know, you know we can't do this without you. We've, we've had a little bit of a, a roller coaster over the last couple of weeks. So for you guys hanging with us uh, and looking forward to that project, sound that drop on January 2nd, January 5th. Um, we're really excited. So anyways, that's going to do it for us. I'm Ray Mack. That is BZB. Yeah.